Okay, let's uh, let's get going. A few more people may join us. I'm Bob Gardner. I'm on the Monroe County Board of Supervisors, and I've been hosting the Citizens Wildfire Academy for the last several months. Tonight we've got sort of a double double header, a double header on football on TV, and a double header on the Citizens Wildfire Academy. Sort of double header Monday. Uh, we've got a great presentation uh, about smoke from Kimberly Mitchell. Kimberly's with the Great Basin Air Qualified Air Quality Unified Control Board. Maybe I got those words mixed up a little bit. Uh, Kimberly, and then Chris McCrasick. <laughs> Chris is our Director of Emergency Management at Fremontal County, and he's going to talk about evacuation and emergency uh, preparedness procedures. Uh, they've got good uh, presentations lined up. Um, and then, of course, as we normally do, we'll have um, opportunities for questions at the end of the, the two presentations. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, but uh, let's get going. Kimberly, you're gonna, why don't you start out and let's uh, hear about smoke in the, the uh, Mono County in the Eastern Sierra and how to deal with that. Great, thanks, Bob. I'm gonna go ahead and share a presentation with you all. Go ahead and... All right. Thanks uh, for having me here. We'll be talking about um, smoke and mostly what the steps that you guys can take um, in your own homes and with your families about how to protect yourself from smoke. But before we jump into that, uh, I wanna explain a bit about uh, who I am and what our agency does here in um, our three counties. So I am Kimberly Mitchell. I'm a data analyst with Great Basin Unified Air Pollution Control District. It is a mouthful um, and our acronym is even worse. Uh, we have a team here of a little over 20 folks who monitor um, pollutants throughout Inyo, Mono and Alpine County. Um, and we have been doing that since the late seventies. So um, we're kind of a little known agency but we do a lot of work through uh, Inyo, Mono and Alpine counties. So here in the picture, you can see the area we cover which is quite large as far as the state of California goes. We cover um, a huge geography. Um, you can see a handful of our sites here up in the top right is the site that is actually on top of the Rite Aid building in Mammoth Lakes. Um, and our site technicians are out there, uh, rain, snow, or shine, except for when the snow gets so deep that we can't get the hatch open. So on occasion, that does happen. Um, on the bottom left, you can see our site at uh, Lee Vining. Um, right there by Mona Lake and and on the bottom right is a mobile monitor which I'm going to talk a little bit more about but you may see one of these deployed in your community helping to monitor the conditions so we monitor uh, mostly for particulate matter PM10 and PM2.5 um, those are sizes of particulates but we do monitor some other pollutants listed there and we um, have a huge network of meteorological monitors. So precipitation and uh, temperatures and wind speeds, which help to inform uh, what the weather, how the weather will impact the pollutants that are moving through our air. So we have 14 permanent monitors. Um, an additional, uh, and those permanent monitors monitor for uh, pollutants as well as uh, meteorological conditions. And then an additional six sites that are only looking at meteorological conditions and we also work with quite a few partners to, um, who are permittees who monitor their own data, but we digest that data and review it to make sure that the public is um, not experiencing any unhealthy conditions. Um, and then in addition, we have emergency monitors that we move around when needed. So I mentioned that we mostly monitor for particulates. Um, what are particulates? They're, they're small aerosolized um, bits in the air. And when I say small, I mean quite small. So when we're talking about PM10, that's like a dust particle. Um, and we are looking at about one fifth of the size of an average human hair. And then when we talk about PM2.5, we're talking about cutting that again in a quarter. Um, and that's uh, mostly comes from smoke, be it wood smoke or wildfire smoke or other conditions. Um, so we're talking about very small bits of particulate that can get into deep into your lungs and into your bloodstream. Um, and these particulates can have impacts on your respiratory system. They have impacts on heart health. 
And new studies are coming out currently that are showing that uh, higher particulates in communities are related to um, brain health. So issues with Alzheimer's are higher in areas with high particulates um, and decline uh, function as you get older. So they, they have a huge impact on our bodies because they're so small and they can get in deep and make impacts. So that's kind of an overview, but what we're here to talk about tonight is wildfire smoke. Um, and I want to talk a bit about how Great Basin Unified Air Pollution Control District supports our communities when a wildfire event occurs. Um, this is a picture from a number of years back outside of Levining. Um, we, we got into the community pretty quickly after this fire started and deployed an emergency monitor so we could see what the conditions were like right there in town next to the fire. So this is a pretty heavy data slide. Um, no, I'm not going to read it for y'all, but what I want you to know is that the air pollution data that is collected in our communities for PM10 and PM2.5 and ozone um, and some other pollutants, that data gets used by multiple agencies and it gets recalculated into multiple indexes. Um, so we receive a lot of phone calls asking us questions why some numbers look one way and some numbers look another way. Um, so I did want to highlight with the public um, what, what these numbers mean and the best way that we can utilize them. Um, I think I may have skipped over a slide. Let's see. Okay, we're working with a different slide than the one I printed, but that's okay. We will um, work with this. Um, so hourly concentrations can be found on uh, Great Basin's website and on some other websites. And these concentrations are, are readings from one hour prior, and they are um, utilized to show the most rapidly changing conditions. So especially in our areas, we have weather patterns that come in and out and in and out. And so that smoke or dust can come in rapidly and it can also move out rapidly. So using raw readings from the air monitor, looking at one hour of PM 2.5 data or one hour of PM 10 data can be a really useful tool in determining rapidly changing conditions. Um, but sometimes we have impacts in our communities that are lasting for a day or uh, we hope not, but does occur multiple days or even weeks on end. And so sometimes we wanna use averaging numbers to show the impact over time of maybe lower concentrations, but because we're being exposed for multiple hours on, in, on end, um, we are experiencing more impacts to our body because of that long-term exposure. So some of the better tools and indexes and recalculations for that are the air quality index, which is also referred to as the AQI. Um, I Most folks who have become interested in air quality over the last few years, um, anybody who was living here in 2020, that's become a part of our vernacular, the AQI. Um, so the AQI is an index that is actually calculated for PM10 and PM2.5 based on 24 hour averages and how those pollutants impact our bodies over a long range of 24 hours exposure. Um, this is the only index currently that has been researched and tied to health impacts. So when we put out a designation on the NOWCAST, AQI NOWCAST, which I'm gonna talk about or in a raw reading, um, we can, make pretty educated guesses about what it's doing to your body and make some recommendations on whether it's going to have impacts. Um, we've got a lot of information, but the only one tied to the real health studies and scientific studies at this point um, documented is the 24 hour exposures. Um, so the AQI index is often used to show how a community was impacted the day prior or an averaging over um, a year saying you had this many healthy days or this many unhealthy days. Um, but it's not very useful if we're trying to communicate to the public and the immediate about what their exposure is um, at that moment. So 
The folks who created the Air Quality Index have made an adjustment called the AQI Nowcast. And this is um, a little more responsive to real-time conditions. It uses a 12-hour averaging, and it does some weighting to say that if conditions are changing rapidly to focus more on the most recent hours. Um, and it's making guesses about what that AQI might be over time on a shorter time frame. So when I make recommendations to our public about which data they should be using, um, for one, I want folks to know that all the data is coming from a different source. It's just being displayed and indexed in different ways. Um, so we can trust all of these readings, even though they are looking maybe different. They're just showing us different ways to view the data. Um, if conditions are changing extremely rapidly, smoke just came in and it wasn't here an hour ago, I would recommend taking a look at your hourly concentrations. If you're kind of in a day pattern and you've been seeing smoke over time through the day, I would take a look at the AQI Nowcast to give you a good indicator of what the impact to your health is going to be. Um, and I don't actually recommend that most folks use the, the actual AQI number unless you're summarizing data to look back historically. Um, and that kind of gives us information about how our communities were impacted. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing just real quick, but I'll keep talking um, and see if I can get up the proper presentation for you guys so that um, we can see our best bet. I'm not sure, let me actually grab real quick. Um, so at, at Great Basin, we also deploy emergency monitors um, into our communities and that data, is also used to, you know what, we're just gonna go ahead with what we've got. Um, there we go. The emergency monitors that we use can be deployed into communities where we don't have a permanent monitor. Um, so for example, currently we have multiple monitors in Inyo County around Owens Lake where we're monitoring and um, we have a monitor in Mammoth and we have a monitor in Levining, but when we get into Alpine County, uh, we don't have any permanent monitors. Um, we can deploy one of these emergency monitors that you see in the picture there, um, and we can get that into the community within an hour or two plus drive time. So we have uh, set up agreements with multiple locations and communities, community centers, fire departments, forest service offices to allow us to deploy these and be a little more flexible within our communities. Um, this year we have five and four have been deployed since the beginning of the season. They've been especially useful this year up in Alpine County um, with the impacts from the mosquito fire um, and also in Bridgeport where um, often the smoke will sink in and we've seen that pattern year after year. So we know that it's a pretty good guess to deploy there early and chances are there will be impacts there. Um, the agency here does use some personal sensors which can be purchased by members of the public. Um, and there's a pretty decent network in our community of personal monitors. And so we watch those personal monitors which aren't as accurate but do have a great geographic coverage. Um, to determine if we should be moving our emergency monitors into communities that are being impacted more heavily than we realized. So that's a great tool that we're using and many of you perhaps, or maybe um, your offices are hosting these personal type pollution monitors. Um, additionally, the Great Basin does issue health advisories. So you are um, welcome to visit our website and sign up for our health alerts and we will, um, push out emails when there are events going on with information about how you can find out about the smoke and what the smoke is going to be doing. Um, and that's on our website listed there to sign up. So, all right, where can I find information during a smoke event? Go ahead. Um, so you can visit our website and once you're at our website, there's a button um, on the front page whenever there's a smoke event going on that says active smoke. And if you click through there, you're going to find a wealth of information on um, smoke models. You can see there in the center picture, that's the um, personal monitors I was talking about kind of shown in our area, fire boundaries, um, and other information about how to protect your health during a smoke event. 
So in the presentation that I thought I was, I thought I had loaded up here, um, we had a whole bunch of details on this slide. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. I had kind of spread it out because I think that this is the most important thing I want to share with the public is how you can take strategies to reduce exposure to wildfire smoke. So number one is knowing the air quality conditions in your area. And I just talked about lots of places you can go to find that information. Um, we push out data and share it with other agencies. Typically on a large fire event, there's going to be a smoke advisor on their air uh, or an air resource advisor um, on the fire team. And they're gonna be putting out reports for communities that are impacted. Um, they also do a great job predicting how communities are going to be impacted throughout the day because they have the information about burning plans, um, what types of fuels are going to be digested, which is something that we can acquire at Great Basin once a day, but they're getting that information from the incident command team constantly. Um, so those air resource advisor reports that you might find on NC Web um, are really powerful when you're trying to determine what, what the conditions throughout the day might be. And those folks are using the data that we are sharing. Um, sometimes they deploy their own emergency monitors as well if needed. So the second thing that you can do is reduce your exposure to smoke. And so there are several ways we can do this. Um, most importantly is to try and remove yourself from the most heavily impacted air times and stay indoors um, and also reduce the amount of exercise or exertion you're doing. So if you need to mow your lawn, it's best to take a look at what the conditions are going to be for the day and figure out the best place to time that or just you know, let your grass grow a little longer for a few weeks and tell your neighbors it's because there was too much smoke. Um, you can use me as an excuse anytime you don't want to mow your lawn. Um, it's pertinent to cancel outdoor public events if the smoke is significant. Um, and this cannot always feel great, right? We put a lot of time into our events and we want to have, uh, you know, people come here because of the beauty of being outside. But there are times where we need to cancel soccer practice for children. We need to um, reduce the time perhaps we're outside if conditions are marginal and um, do a, a less intensive practice um, and consider canceling outdoor events if conditions are hazardous. And we have seen that happen in our communities over the last few years, unfortunately. Um, I do wanna highlight that Typical masks, your, your cloth masks that you've been using for COVID or surgical masks are not going to uh, filter out the PM 2.5. Um, a properly fitted N95 or P100 can reduce exposure, but you don't wanna be wearing those for too long because you're reducing your oxygen intake. Um, and bandanas, wet or dry, they're, they're not reducing the exposure to particulates. So it can be a false sense of confidence when we're utilizing those um, tools. So keep that in mind. Um, as we move along the line to indoor air quality, um, you should be avoiding adding pollution inside of your home. It's something we don't think of, but when you're vacuuming or cooking, um, you're creating particulates just there in your own home. And in a normal day, that may not be a big deal, but in a lot of our homes, we're not well sealed. So we don't wanna be adding to our personal pollution um, while the air outside is so much worse, right? Um, if you are lucky enough in our community to have an air conditioner, it's best to have good filters, a MERV 12, 11, 12, 13 on that air conditioner and to run it on recirculate. And that's going to give you some, some real quality improvement within your home. Uh, but if you're like me and most people in our communities, you either don't have an air conditioning unit or you utilize a swamp cooler. Um, the swamp cooler is not going to filter out any particulates. I mean, it can be really difficult in our communities to make a decision between whether to keep cool or whether to be bringing that smoke into our home. Um, and that's a, a decision that needs to be made by each of us as we're moving through the day. It's a hard one um, on any given day. If you aren't able to keep your home cool and the air quality is really significant and you have health impacts, um, there are some really fabulous um, programs starting up to create some clean air spaces in our communities. Both Mono and Inyo counties have um, pursued new air filters to put into some of their community centers. So we are hoping that that's going to be an option for folks going forward. 
Um, and sometimes if the air is just too significantly bad, it, it may be worth it to look at a map and see where you can uh, find a friend who's not in the area to hunker down with if, uh, if your health is being impacted. Uh, we can create clean rooms and clean air shelters within our homes. Um, there's a link at the end of this presentation, hopefully, um, that has a great link to the EPA website uh, that um, shows how to create a clean room. That link is also on our website. Um, you can take steps to create one small space of your home, hopefully in an interior space where there's less likelihood for the smoke to come through cracks, um, especially if you have an at-risk member. And there are also ways to create uh, inexpensive clean air uh, filters using box fans and filters to reduce exposure if um, you're not able to buy a more industrial grade one. Finally, it's really important to listen to your body. You know your body best. You know how your body's feeling. Um, and we are all the best judge of how, how the impacts of smoke are hitting us. Um, so listen to yourself and consult your doctor if you're having any trouble and make sure that you have the tools to help your own health on hand, your inhaler, um, before the season even starts. Um, and it's important to be aware that some populations are impacted more quickly. Children, um, they have smaller, less developed lungs. They're gonna have quicker impacts. So we may want to cancel soccer for children before we cancel it for an adult league. Um, people obviously who have heart or lung disease um, and then pregnant women are having different impacts on their body. And it's important to remember that if you're an outdoor worker, you're having a lot more exposure through your day. So you need to be carefuler in your off time um, at home, maybe more careful than somebody who's an office worker or somebody who hasn't been out in it all day. All right, I'm not gonna talk about data here, but I do wanna talk about a few other things that are not on this, um, one being uh, I alluded to the fact that we are going to have some new clean air shelters opening up um, in both Inyo and Alpine County or Inyo and Mono counties when we have smoke events going on. And we've been working with the, the county agencies to, to start implementing those plans because we do know that smoke is going to come. Um, and so we want to be sure that our communities have places to go if they're having trouble. Um, and then finally, I'm going to link on our front page of our website before I leave this evening, um, a, a comprehensive list of websites that we would recommend you visit if you are curious about smoke. And we are always happy to take phone calls, emails, questions. I spend a lot of time during the smoke season um, just chatting with folks and explaining what our data means and what it means for you. Um, so please utilize us, that's, that's what we're here for, that's our job, and um, we're very thankful to have the opportunity to share with you guys tonight. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Okay, maybe maybe we'll save the questions till after the next presentation. That sounds great. Uh, so, so remember your questions out there. Thank you, Kimberly. There's a lot of, a lot of great uh, meat in there and substance. Um, and so I appreciate that a, a lot. And in terms of just information that that a lot of us, uh, at least I, didn't know. So thank you very much. Chris McCrasick, uh, you're up. So uh, evacuation, when, when a fire happens and, and uh, in terms of being ready for an emergency, what, what do we do? What happens? Take it away. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Okay, and to save a little bandwidth, I'm gonna kind of stop my video um, and, and minimize so I can see everything. All right, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate being here this evening. Um, I've got about 40 years in emergency services. I actually started uh, my career back in 1985 here in Mono County uh, where I was a paramedic. Um, I left in 2001 uh, as the chief paramedic and then also the fire chief in Animal Valley. Um, and then I traveled from California to Washington where I was a fire chief and then up to Alaska for 10 years as a fire chief. And during that time, um, you had a lot of experience with fires, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, and even volcanic eruptions. So a lot of experience in emergency management and 
uh, emergency preparedness in those areas. Um, came back to Mono County in 2017 as the EMS chief. Um, and now I have an exciting new role as the emergency manager uh, for Mono County or director of emergency management. Because uh, definitely Mono County is not immune uh, to major incidents, um, be that fires or floods, uh, severe weather events. So it's a very unique area here. What I want to talk about tonight is emergency um, alerts and evacuations. You know, in the previous Citizens Wildfire Academies, you learned about fuel reduction, uh, home hardening, and defensible space. Um, so now we get to the point of now there's a major incident and there's a, a wildfire um, and the incident commanders on scene have determined that it's time to evacuate. Uh, so hopefully you've prepared your home so that you can leave um, and evacuate with some peace and peace of mind. But I want to talk about, you know, all the questions that are going to arise from that. You know, what do I do now? How will I know when it's time to evacuate? Uh, what do I take with me? What do I do about my animals and where do I go? So hopefully we'll be able to answer those questions here tonight. All right. Um, tactical priorities. These are going to belong to the fire, fire departments and the sheriff's department in their priorities when there's an incident. And their first priority um, is to save lives, life safety, incident stabilization, to control the incident, and property conservation. Um, I, I like this photo of a CAL FIRE uh, airplane doing a retardant drop, um, you know, between the active flames and the home. And so they're, they're really trying to, you know, protect property, stabilize the incident, um, but the incident commanders on scene are going to make the ones, make the decisions on when it's time to evacuate. Um, you know, and that's going to be based on an imminent life threat. Uh, fire spread and fire behavior poses an increasing threat. Um, and the fire department needs to get into neighborhoods with a lot of resources um, without having to fight uh, outgoing traffic. Um, so they're going to want to give advance notice, you know, but then like the Mountain View fire uh, up in Walker a couple of years ago, um, that was an incredible wind driven event um, that really people had no, had really no advance notice. I mean, it was almost impossible to get out of that fire. Um, so that created some very, you know, unique situations um, in California where we're prepared for wildfires and we know, you know, the fire experts can usually uh, figure out and predict the fire behavior um, so that hopefully we can call for an evacuation ahead of time um, and then have um, little trigger points um, as far as, you know, you may get an immediate evacuation warning or, you know, alert, or you may have, you know, just a warning that you know, to be be ready, get ready, and once we let you know, it's time to evacuate and it's time to leave. You know, fire emergencies are very dynamic, and you know we're going to do our best to inform and to warn as quick as possible. In Mono County, we have emergency alerts that go out, um, and we really invite you to visit the ready.mono page. Uh, to sign up for emergency alerts. Um, the federal, state, tribal, and local authorities, as well as the National Weather Service, you know, in the event of a tornado or flash flooding or a, a severe weather event, they have the, the ability to uh, not only send out an, an emergency alert in a recorded message, both in English and in Spanish, uh, but those alerts can be as big as nationwide all the way down to, you know, our county or just a neighborhood. We can alert you of an incident that's occurring in just a very specific area. Those alerts are going to identify you, identify who is sending the message, uh, what is the emergency, 
and where you need to go or what you need to do to find out additional information. Another tool that Mono County has is the Zone Haven. Uh, this software is available and accessible through the ready.mono. Um, this divides the county into geographical areas or zones. Um, and, you know, we've had emergency responders um, that town leaders, you know, have all gotten together and we've identified these, these zones throughout Mono County. And so the above picture shows just south of uh, Bridgeport. Uh, some of the areas just north of Mono Lake and Bodie. Uh, so we've drawn these lines and it's based on, um, you know, road roads and past fire behavior as well as or, uh, natural barriers. Um, so this is, is a tool th that we use. We ask you to, to go and look and identify what zone that we've created for you. Uh, because we'll be using this tool when we're doing emergency evacuations and alerts um, as far as advising you which zones are under evacuation order and where you can find additional information. Um, one thing with evacuations, don't wait. If you see something happening, there's, you know, there's a fire. If you feel unsafe, go ahead and evacuate. You don't have to wait for that evacuation order. Um, if you evacuate early, you can avoid heavy traffic. Um, if you're instructed to leave, we ask you to do so. Um, if you choose not to, don't be surprised if law enforcement is going to ask for information so they can, you know, in a worst case scenario, contact next of kin. Um, you know, it's all about your safety and that's the number one priority. Um, so it's, it's a new tool for Mono County. And we definitely encourage you to go to ready.mono uh, to find out more. You know, with all this high tech, um, you know, software and, and information that we have uh, online, we know that there's definitely individuals that just aren't into all that tech, into all that tech stuff. Um, but know that you're not forgotten about and we've made plans to take care of you also. Um, we want you to know that you're gonna receive alerts via your landline, um, but also that nothing replaces the, not, the knock on the door from the fire department or law enforcement. Um, you know, and then if you have a neighbor who, you know, isn't into cell phones and computers, you know, be sure you check on them early and, and you know, let responders know that there's someone that could be in need and need assistance to evacuate. Uh, we also ask you to contact the county, uh, public health, social services, or even emergency management. Um, just give us a call and we'd be glad to help you sign up uh, for alerts, for access and functional needs, which is a database um, that lets us know where individuals may need assistance and first responders are going to database available to them um, so that they can prioritize during an evacuation who to contact first and who's going to need additional help and assistance getting out. So during an evacuation, um, as far as prioritizing what you need, um, what your priority should be, um, so there's the six P's of evacuation. People and pets, uh, number one, Papers, phone numbers, important documents, prescriptions, vitamins, eyeglasses, so any of your medications that you're gonna need because you're just not sure when you're gonna be able to return home. Um, pictures and irreplaceable memorabilia, uh, personal computers, um, information on hard drives and disks, uh, and then plastic, credit cards, ATM cards, and cash. Because again, you're not, you don't know when you're gonna be able to go back um, and then something you, know, you can add to that is chargers for your cell phones also. As far as your animals, you know, Mono County Animal Services, they're very active and they participate in evacuation exercises and preparation. But just some things to think about with larger livestock, 
uh, and horses when you have to evacuate. Um, if you think that there's even a chance of evacuating, start planning and do so early. Um, get the animals out of confined spaces and pens and then lock the gates and the doors behind them so they can't get back in because the animals will, say, will seek um, what they know as safety uh, back in the barn and in their stalls. Um, but in a fire, that's, you know, the barns are going to be the first things to go up and they're definitely safer in the outdoors and out in, the, in um, very wide open spaces. Uh, leave water available. Definitely mark your animals, you know, and that can be with main tags, um, you, you know, duct tape on the main so you can identify your animals afterwards. And then they also recommend leather halters, but not nylon because, you know, in the heat of the moment, it can, the, the nylon can melt. So you want to keep your animals safe. So once we've told you to evacuate, we're going to tell you to go to a temporary uh, evacuation point. Um, a temporary evacuation point is not a shelter. Um, this is a place where you can go and seek immediate safety, you know, park your vehicle, uh, get further emergency information from county staff and emergency responders. Um, kind of gather your thoughts and just take a deep breath and figure out what's going on and what you need to do next. Uh, you can call family and friends. You can charge your cell phones. Um, that make a plan. What are we going to do from here out? What are we going to do tonight? Where are we going to stay? Um, and identify a place to stay, whether you're going to call friends um, or you're just going to stay here until we open an evacuation shelter. Um, you know, use the public restroom and get some water. Um, shelters, if needed, are usually located in community centers and depending on the size of the incident, it could go as big as school gyms or even the fairgrounds down in Bishop if needed. Um, they provide the basic needs. Um, you'll be provided a cot and a blanket um, and we'll make preparations for, you know, some food assistance. But just know that when you make your plan and you're thinking about it, um, you really want to, you know, a shelter is is going to be something kind of as a last option in an evacuation. Um, it's definitely not, we'll provide the extreme basic needs, but it's definitely not going to be a comfortable place to stay. Um, you know, but we, and we want to keep you safe, but um, just when you're putting together your plan, think about where you want to stay and yeah, shelter probably shouldn't be your first option. You know, once directed uh, that the fire danger is over, um, our first priority is going to get you back into your home as soon as it's safe to do so. And really, once we initiate an evacuation, we immediately start to think about getting people back into their homes. Uh, we do that. Um, with safety as the priority. Um, it can be frustrating that you're not able to get in right away, um, but you know we want to make sure that you're safe as well as the responders and the firefighters that have hose across the roadways and are you know still doing some cleanup on the fire that they can continue to do so safely. So that's our priority. Um, What's on the screen now is our ready.mono uh, website. Uh, this provides a place to sign up for emergency alerts, for access and functional needs, um, information on public safety power shutoffs, um, wildland fire preparedness, and other disaster resources. Um, so that's under the get ready. Under emergency, um, we're going to be posting information on current incidents. Um, so you can always, you know, stay abreast of what's going on and what's going on with emergencies within the county. Uh, and then recover. We want to provide you with assistance uh, post incident so that you can become whole again and we can put you in um, contact with resources that can really just help you, you know, really recover from an incident. 
Um, and while this tonight's presentation really focused on wildland fire, um, there's a lot of information uh, on this website um, that's applicable to a variety of natural and human caused events. So with that, I will stop sharing and we can now go to questions. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, again, a lot of good information there. All right, let's let's uh, let's uh, take questions. You can type questions into the chat or um, we can uh, promote you. Uh, Danielle, if you're prepared, we can promote people if they put their hands up or uh, type it into the chat. One I saw right away, I think Kimberly, you were about to respond, was regarding um, the availability of information in Spanish language. Can you comment on that? Yeah, we, we did start to do some work in translating some of our material um, before COVID and lost some momentum um, as um, everything went a bit crazy. But I do think it's a focus that we do want to, it's an important need in our communities and is absolutely uh, on our radar. And I hope to see that we will be doing more of that going forward. And I will definitely feed uh, that feedback up our leadership chain. Um, I think it's it's important to know that the folks in our communities are asking for it. So thank Great. you for the question. And Chris, you mentioned a little bit about that. Do you want to elaborate on that in terms of the availability of uh, the information in the Spanish language? We do. All of our uh, information that we provide is available in Spanish, uh, as well as emergency alerts. So that is definitely a priority of ours, that you're going to get your alert in English and in Spanish. That's great. OK, uh, any other questions? Um, put your hand up or jump in the chat if you'd like. Uh, one thing while we're waiting, um, I noticed, um, Kimberly, you mentioned listening to your body. And it yes. reminded me, <laughs> reminded me dating myself here in the late 60s in Orange County. We'd be <laughs> outside on the, on the uh, you know, athletic, doing athletic events and feel that incredible pain in our chest. And sort of like, oh, this must be the ozone or the, the air pollution in, in Southern California. Sort of like, yeah, it really is. The smog really is bad here. Well, we didn't listen to our bodies really well. Um, uh, and so hopefully I'm not paying for it now. But uh, that, that was a great example. You could actually feel that pain when you took a deep breath. Yeah, that was uh, me as a child growing up in the late 80s. I thought it was very normal to experience chest pain after swimming for a day. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized that's not how our body should feel. So that also lends to, right, we we do get some ozone impacts in our area. Um, we're lucky we don't live in the city, but but Bishop and some of our desert communities can have some natural ozone that's created. And so it is important to, maybe even if it doesn't look bad outside, to take a look at that air quality index on occasion, because sometimes we don't see, with wildfire smoke or dust, it's very visible. Um, but some of the impacts from ozone can be felt in our bodies, and it's important to touch base with that data or how your body's feeling on any given minute. So yeah, definitely. Absolutely. And of course, they've made a lot of progress on that, but then it sort of goes up and down. I mean, we make progress and then more vehicles are on the road and it's different. But of course, a lot of us came up to the Eastern Sierra to get away from <laughs> ozone and things, and perhaps some of these other things are keeping back on us. Thank you, Chris, for putting your contact information uh, in the chat there. Uh, let's see, we have some other questions. Okay, um, let's see, Luis Medina, one other question. Has WhatsApp been considered as a platform to get out emergency messages? It's a platform that a lot of immigrant communities use because it allows them to stay in touch with people in their home country free of charge. Phone calls through WhatsApp don't cost anything. Also, visitors from overseas might have WhatsApp on their phone. Thought it couldn't hurt to ask. Good question, uh, Chris. You know, that's that's an excellent question, and I've just written that down. You know, the Emergency Management Office has only been, you know, was only created about two months ago. Um, so it's evolving, and we're looking at all different options as far as getting the word out. Um, and so that's, that's an excellent idea and something we'll definitely look into, you know, because that's the, our priority is, is to use all avenues social media, Facebook, Twitter, um, everything to get the word out. So that's gonna definitely a priority of ours. So yeah, thank you for that. 
Okay, another question, uh, Deborah Murphy, I use, can I see the distinct outline of mountain as my barometer for air quality? Does that make good sense? Good question, I do the same thing. Kimberly? Yeah, so we do have, um, I'm, hopefully you guys can see here my screen, I'm sharing from our website, um, some recommendations on visibility. Um, so it depends on how far away your mountains are. I don't know, Deborah, how far from your visual. Um, this is a recommendation that you can use visually. If you're out hiking, you're up in the mountains, um, you're, it can't see your neighbor's house, uh, you can't see your car from the parking lot. Um, these are kind of, uh, you know, it's a rough idea. And of course we should be knowing what's going on in our bodies, but a rough visibility assessment to determine health impacts. I will preface this with um, often uh, in the Owens Valley, less often in Mono County or Alpine County, um, we can get a layer of smoke that is uh, layered, right? So we, it, it is up high and is not at ground level in Bishop, Big Pine, all the way down in Yo County. Um, so the smoke has come in, but it's staying lofted and it's not hitting ground level. So visibility is a great tool to use. Um, if there's a monitor in your area, it may be telling you something than what different than what your eyes are seeing, because we can have conditions here in our microclimate that um, allow for the smoke to be really visible, but not at ground level impacting our health. So that's something to keep in mind. Just because it looks bad doesn't... Uh, necessarily always mean it is bad, but it's better to err on the side of caution um, and definitely to listen to your body. So um, hopefully this answers your question. And I did share um, from Great Basin's homepage, if you click um, the smoke presentation that I had initially planned um, for to share with you guys that just had a few different slides than the one that ended up getting shared, which was for a board meeting. Um, but I do wanna share just real quick that there are links to all of these important um, tools at the end of this presentation. So feel free to visit our website um, and click through. These are external links that, um, you know, Mono County's public health page and um, some really good tools for understanding what the fires are doing. And then some internal pages, including the visibility chart here, right off of our homepage, um, as well as some directions on how to create. I wanted to share a lot with you guys about how to create your own um, do-it-yourself air cleaner, but you guys can check it out here and uh, check out this link for building an inexpensive air cleaner in your home. So sorry that the presentation got mixed up. Yeah, I'm sorry we got mixed up on that, but thank you for, for uh, yeah. putting these on. Uh, another question from Rick Cattleman. Interesting. In the past few years, there have been a few studies of wildland firefighters that indicate remarkable resiliency of human lungs to put up with particulate in inhalation. Uh, the, I've only read the press reports. Do you have any information about the fundamental research? Um, those, those aren't the reports that I've been reading. I'd definitely be interested in seeing them. Um, we are seeing some significant impacts in bodies. Um, there was just a study I was reading this morning or yesterday morning about the link of exposure over time to Alzheimer's. A lot of the particulate studies that do come out are actually more focused on road dust and some urban sources. So there is a new angle of study going on with EPA and, and between health uh, officials to try and determine um, if the particulates that we're taking in by, you know, from wildfire smoke, a little bit more of a natural, if you will, well, sometimes it depends on what's burning, um, natural inhalation of wood or um, combustibles may be different than the studies that were done on road dust or these other particulates. So I think that the studies are still going on, but I, I have not seen, the, the studies I've seen coming out for wildland firefighters have not been positive. So um, I'd be happy to have those sent our way. If, uh, if you've if you've seen them, I remember years ago people would talk about clean smoke, and I always that thought, how can there ever be clean smoke? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Any other questions or comments? Good. Good. Talk I do now. not see any other hands raised. Okay. Give a few more four minutes, if in case anybody has anything. 
Uh, it's really interesting. I know the smoke is is frustrating for us uh, because we don't originate it, <laughs> and we are at the mercy of the winds. Um, and and I think somebody was telling me, gosh, we're doing everything we can about fire prevention and fuels treatment and everything to to control wildfires. And then the smoke blows in. Uh, you know, what's the point? Well, there's a lot of point there because <laughs> we want to prevent certainly the wildfires. And need to keep working hard on that. Uh, but we are at the mercy of uh, of the winds. Um, I kid my friends, I'm in June Lake, and I kid my friends in Mammoth and say, oh, we've got smoke over here. We're going to have to turn those fans on on June Mountain again and blow it back over to you guys. Uh, but the reality is we really are at the mercy of the winds. And they change quickly. Sometimes I'll look out the window and it looks hazy. And then a few minutes later, the wind has changed and it's cleared up. Yeah, we see very rapid changing conditions in our area, um, right? The same those same patterns that bring these storms in to create great skiing also are channels that bring the smoke right into us. So when you think about the way it's going to move in a fluid mass, uh, a fluid kind of pattern, uh, it's not not surprising which communities um, get hit time and time again. So yeah, and it is hard. In some respects, we've been lucky to have um, as little smoke as we have over historically, and I'm afraid that may not be in in our future. But that that's uh, maybe what we're facing. A lot of people say to me that they have sort of a strategy that when the smoke gets tough, they have a place they can go. And, and uh, certainly you, you have to be in a comfortable enough position to be able to do that. But sometimes just being able to get out of the environment for a while is sometimes the best thing to do. And I think that the work that the counties are doing right now um, and the communication between us and them to hopefully create these clean air shelters will give people a place to at least take a breathing break locally when conditions get horrible, um, maybe like a year like 2020 where we were just day in, day out, day in, day out. And if we can provide folks a cool place to breathe some clean air for a couple hours a day um, to give their, their bodies a break, that's, it's, uh, I'm really excited about the partnerships that we've been working with Pothenio and Mono County to try and create these spaces because the smoke is not going anywhere. Um, and so we we need to figure out how we can best support our public when those events come around. Okay, interesting question from Mary Young. Any specific monitoring monitoring of gases from on Mammoth Mountain? We are not currently monitoring any gaseous pollutants in Mammoth historically. Um, and I think I, I would have to look up the dates, but I think it was the late 80s, early 90s, there was some ozone monitoring. Um, but I, I'm assuming you're kind of referring to the um, the gases that can come out um, on occasion and cause trouble for folks. And we, as an agency, do not currently monitor that. Okay. Getting back to some of the evacuation, Chris, I know that um, some of the most important stuff that you pointed out was really having a plan and sort of a, uh, an, an idea of what to do. Um, we always hope that we won't have to do it, but um, being ready to go, what you take, what you're going to do, knowing what's going to happen in terms of those temporary evacuation areas, really thinking it through is really important. And we can't probably stress that enough um, in, in terms of just trying to make sure. And, and I also appreciate, I know I have friends in Mammoth who have talked a lot about their concern for their neighbors uh, who just may not be as prepared. And so uh, that is a matter of, uh, you know, really looking out for each other and helping them out, uh, especially if, if things get rough in a short period of time. Anything you wanna add on that, Chris? You know, as a matter of fact, September is National Preparedness Month, and we are making a big push uh, to advertise our website, as well as signing up for emergency alerts, um, and also access some functional needs. So this is really a, you know, a good time to, to really think access the website. There are lists, you know, definitely more in depth than the ones that I presented tonight as far as what you need to think about, what you need to take. Um, so, you know, again, it says ready.mono. So that's what we're pushing. We want Mono County residents to be prepared, um, not just wildland fire season, uh, but traveling on snowy roads. You want to be prepared uh, for, you know, something unexpected. Um, the wind and weather events, public safety, um, power shutdowns, things like that. So there's there's plenty of things to be ready for here in Mono County, uh, and I think we're doing a really good job uh, of providing the, the, you the information that you're going to need. 
That's great. And anybody who has any questions can certainly follow up. I know something uh, my wife and I have talked about for years and we finally did. We bought about five or six bins, plastic bins, and we have them in the garage. And we went through the house and made a list of, okay, this is what goes in the bin. And, and just each room, we take this, we don't take this. And so, and we have that list actually, we have it for our house sitters as well. And such that in 10 or 15 minutes, we could go through the house, fill up the bins, throw them in the car and be out of here. And, and, and it may sound easier than, than it is at the time, but at least we finally got off the dime and did that. So we weren't uh, in a position to run around with our heads cut off and had at least a plan as to what we would take. And it's hard to decide what you would take in that situation, but, but certainly um, it at least got us a little more organized in terms of planning for that type of a tragic event. Okay, um, I think, oh, wait a minute, let's see. Is there any way of checking on whether or not breakaway gates between Mono City and Highway 167 are working? Mary, this comes up all the time. Um, and we've worked that with um, one with uh, Public Works um, and they, they work. Uh, there have been complaints that they don't work, but uh, my understanding from Public Works, uh, this comes has come up just about every year at the RPAC and the Fire Safe Council that they will work and that you can go through them. I, in fact, I said to somebody, I, at one point I was gonna take my truck out there and bust through it just to prove that they would work. Um, but uh, you can um, contact, um, trying to think who worked on that the last, Tony Dublino's gone, but um, I know that our public work staff is aware of that and uh, we've gone through that. And actually, Chris, I'm not sure you, whether you're familiar with that issue. Uh, these, are, these are breakaway gates that are there um, that are the, is the access between Mono City and Highway 167 and has a gate on it, and that this is a continual concern. It's a it's a very legitimate concern, uh, but certainly um, my understanding is they would work. Kimberly, did you want to respond to that? Nope, just okay. clear in the clear in the chat. All right, but Mary, good question. It comes up, and we should be covering that all the time. Okay, I think we're close to seven. Um, if, unless there's any more questions or concerns, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Chris. Good, lots of good information. As always, this information will be uh, put on the Eastern Sierra Wildfire Alliance website, and the recording will. And so you can access it. You can tell your friends and neighbors to check it out, and it'll be there uh, for information for everybody. So it isn't a one-shot deal. It's available. And if you're have any questions, you can follow up with Kimberly or Chris and pursue that as well. So thank you very much for attending. Again, thank our guests for making two great presentations. Our next session is October 17th, Monday night at six o'clock. And at this point, we're gonna be talking about, again, sort of a double header um, insurance, uh, which is a, a, a tough one to, to, to wedge into a, a certain time period but we'll talk about fire insurance and that situation. And then some information about fire safe councils in our fire districts. I'm constantly surprised about people don't really know um, as much about how our fire districts are organized and where they are and then the fire safe councils and they range in terms of some that are quite involved and some are not as involved. So we'll try to have some information about that which would enable people to get involved in that. So that's Monday night, October 17th, the third Monday in October. Again, thank you all for attending and we'll see you next month. Thank all right, you. thank you. Thank you.